So let's go, relationship reset number four. We've gone through a lot of neat things about relationships. The first week we talked about the foundation of a healthy relationship being Jesus. The next week we talked about communication and then last week we went radioactive. Last week we talked about conflict. And so this week I wanna talk to you about growing together. Um, for a long time. Next year, Jen and I are gonna celebrate um, 25 years next year. And I can tell you, you know, I've talked to people that have been married as long as us or less or much longer. And there's always the opportunity when you're with someone for a long time, I think you have to nurture that relationship still. You see, you can either get better or you can get bitter. I heard a funny story about an older couple and they went to the grocery store one day. She decided to live out on the edge and she stole a can of peaches. And on her way out, she got caught. And so here she is, uh, the next day, she's standing in front of a judge, and he's the judge, like, what'd you do, ma'am? She's like, oh, I stole a can of peaches. He said, well, how many peaches were in there? She said, there were six peaches in the can, your honor. He says, well, we're just gonna go with six days in jail then. And then her husband, he was in the back, he stood up and he goes, your honor, I just wanna tell you, she also stole a can of peas as well, so. My dad sold that one for years, I love that, that's awesome. You can get bitter, you can get better. Song of Solomon, or some translations say Song of Psalms, we're hanging out right here looking at Mr. and Mrs. Solomon, this great relationship. Let's go with verse six today as our opening scripture. It says, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that your word is life, your word, brings wisdom. Lord, we want to hear you today. Lord, I know that people are going to hear um, the word you want them to hear today, that you're going to direct our hearts and our ears. Let, let us be good ground for the word today. Open our spiritual eyes and ears so that we can be more like you, so we can glorify you in all that we do, and especially in our relationships. Help us today. We thank you for it. And all God's people said... Amen. Um, This in the ancient world, this is like a stamp of ownership. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. Um, It's in the top three. I think it might be top one right now. Uh, Number one reason for families breaking apart, lack of commitment. And I think this speaks to the commitment. How do we keep growing together through the pressures of life? I'm going to give you three ways that I think we can continue to stay strong And so number one is that we have to continually bring trustworthiness to the table in our relationships. Trustworthiness. If you're taking notes, write this down. Love cannot grow where trust is not present. Love cannot grow where trust is not present. Proverbs chapter 11, verse number three says, honesty, guys, good people, dishonesty destroys People. If I want to grow strong, if I want to grow better as, as time goes, then I need to commit to being trustworthy. What does that mean? When someone gives me trust, they put trust in my hand about something, I'm worthy of that. I'm, I'm worthy. I'm, I steward it well. I guard it. I hold it in high regard. Now, what it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that I'm perfect. It doesn't mean that I'm never off. It doesn't mean that I'm always hitting on all cylinders. It doesn't mean that I'm on 100% of the time. You see, um, not because we're horrible, but because we're human, how many know we mess up sometimes, right? Like what we say we're gonna do, what we did didn't match up, and we have a gap, right, in our lives. So when that happens, we have a decision. We have a decision if I'm gonna own the gap if I'm gonna own my mistake, or if I'm going to avoid it or make excuses, or if I'm gonna lie about it. If I make the decision to, to avoid the owning my mistakes, and over time I continually do that, you're gonna hear the faint song of the Elvis Presley music in the background called Suspicious Minds. Anybody love that song, right? Great song, but the message in there is this. If there's constantly trust issues where someone is not owning, like, oh man, here's what's going on, then that creates those gaps, it creates instability. But here's the thing, the quicker I own it, the more it creates um, a a trustworthiness. And, And there's an authenticity that comes 
when I own it, authenticity. And so the greatest enemy of that in our lives, what do you think it is? Pride. Pride keeps us from owning when we mess up. I said something wrong, I did something wrong, I didn't do it right, whatever it was, we've got to say no to pride. So I'm gonna give you um, the way to apologize. Let me give you four levels of I'm sorry. I'm sorry are two great words that we can use in our relationships. You wanna practice on the count of three, let's say it together, one, two, three, I'm sorry, all right? Somebody here today might've been your first time, all right? Well, congratulations. (laughs) Welcome to the club, it's a new way. I'm gonna tell you four levels of I'm sorry. Each is better than the next. The first thing is when someone says, I'm sorry, but. What do y'all think of that one? That's a big but, right? When you say I'm sorry, but, that but negates everything in front of it. That's not owning it. It's like, I'm sorry, but, you know, this happened and that happened. That made me mad. This didn't work. I'm, I'm sorry, but. It's like, I'm not owning it. It was something else. Level one's not a good one at all, right? It's just negating, not owning. Here's level two. I'm sorry if. I'm sorry if what I said hurt you. Okay, that's a little bit better. At least there's, oh, there's some, like, acknowledgement that I did something that caused some pain. But that's really not where you want to land either. You want to get to at least level three. Level three is this. Level three is I'm sorry for. I'm sorry for what I did, full stop. Like, yep, there might have been other factors involved. Yeah, there were some other things in there. I was triggered for this and da-da-da. But see, the, the mature thing, like when we step into this thing, is to say, I'm sorry for what I did. That's complete ownership. That's like owning it, not passing the buck, not blaming, not avoiding. That is powerful. I'm sorry for, but there's a better one. There's a better one, is this, I'm sorry and. I'm sorry and I'm gonna take steps that that doesn't happen anymore, right? I'm sorry and I wanna not do that again. So step number one, we wanna go long-term, wanna get better, not bitter, continually bring trustworthiness to the relationship. Point number two is fan the flame. Fan the flame. I heard a funny story about a guy standing in front of a mirror one evening and um, getting ready to go to bed, he was kind of admiring himself in the mirror. And he looked at his wife of 30 years and he said, honey, will you still love me when I'm old and fat and balding? She simply answered with two words. She said, I do. <laughs> You're a little slow, but there's, he was already old and fat and balding for those. Some people are like, what, is, what does she mean by that? Yeah, she's like already there, honey. Um, anybody see the show Survivor? Uh, how many Survivor fans we got? Raise your hand if you like Survivor, okay? Uh, it's like 40 seasons. I've seen a couple of them. When you go on Survivor, one of the things you got to do is you got to know how to make fire. But still people go on that show and they have no idea how to make fire. And it's the same in our relationships. You got to know how to fan the flame. Now, when you talk about... Fanning the flame, a lot of people just always equate it with romance, and romance is important, but I wanna broaden it to something I think is even more powerful today. I wanna talk about fanning the flame of friendship, okay? Fanning the flame of friendship. Um, Here's a couple ways you can fan the flame. Number one, know the love languages of the people in your life. How many know what the love languages are? Who knows there's five, right? Famous book, who can call out a love language to me? What's one of the love languages? Acts of service, who else? Gifts, quality time, physical touch. What's another one? Words of affirmation, okay? So here's the thing about the love languages. Usually, we try to love others in the way that we experience love. Usually, like if my, if my love language is acts of service, then I try to love others with acts of service. But see, they might not have the same love language that I have, right? And so, you know, I might say, man, acts of service is the way, but Jen might say, no, it's gift giving, okay? Or it's gifts, or it's, you know, words of affirmation. So what I gotta do, if I wanna like fan the flame, is I need to know, and sometimes it's just a good question to ask, 
what makes you feel most loved? What do you think your love languages are? Now, every year I do a relationship series. Last year I talked a lot more about love languages. I wanna land on one idea today, however, okay? One idea. And it comes from uh, a question that someone asked a, a parent when they were really admiring um, their parenting. And they said, man, what, what, what's some of the things you do for parenting? And this guy said, let me tell you what I think one of the most important things for parenting is. Find something that your kid loves to do and then join them in that thing, right? And so and not something you love to do, something they love to do. So if it's, if it's, you know, maybe sports or if it's music or, you know, games, whatever it is, um, find something and join them in that thing. And from that relationship, a lot of good dynamics will come. A lot of relational connections will come from that. Well, I think that's great advice for all our relationships that we want to stay strong. I think that really because the long-term thing, especially let's say you know, 94% of people will be married at some point, um, a long-term marriage, the, yes, romance is important, we, we wanna keep that in there, but the real powerful long-term thing is actually friendship, okay? And so I think one thing that's powerful, let's say with your spouse, is to find something they like to do Maybe it's not your favorite, and join them in that. Now, it's going to take maybe some compromise, some sacrifice. And that doesn't mean we've got to do everything together all the time, right? There are some things that, you know, you might do with uh, someone else. You have fun with, you know, Jen likes to shop. I don't go when she shops, right? I used to, but then I figured out, man, when she shops, I mean, she's just her thing. She's in her zone. I used to go and drink coffee at the mall, and then I'm like, why am I sitting here? I could sit at home, and so I just sit at home, and she has a great time shopping. But don't fall into the trap that all of the fun things you do are with other people. Don't fall into that trap. Because you want to have some things that you do together, whatever that is. Maybe, maybe it's a show you have together. Maybe it's um, a sport. Maybe it's a hobby you have together. Whatever that is, find something. And, and maybe you're going to join her on something. Maybe she's going to join you on something. Maybe you're going to go, you know, join something together, join some club, do some hobby. Um, our hiking group met yesterday. You know, for some people, it's like, you know what, we're going to go hiking together. That sounds kind of cool. Um, some of our groups go axe throwing. Don't do that if you're still in the conflict season, okay, of <laughs> talk about last week. Yeah, I'm going to throw some axes. Better get ready. You know, so, okay. But find something and do that together. Songs chapter 8, verse 6, talking about the love. It says, love, it flashes like fire. It burns like a blazing fire. It's the brightest kind of flame. And so we got to be intentional to add fuel to that, right? And so one way is let's make sure we're having fun together, finding something we do. But let me give you maybe another meaning, maybe a deeper meaning to this, because some theologians would say that the brightest kind of flame is a reference to God. Because the Bible says our God's at what? He is a consuming fire. And so who is God? God is what? He is love. His love never burns out. His love is amazing. What scripture tell us? We love because he first loved us. So let me ask you a question. We all go through seasons when, everybody goes through seasons when they're difficult to love. How do you love someone when they're difficult to love? How do you love someone when it feels like they don't deserve it, but you know they need it? And the answer is, is that we have a reservoir in our heart of God's love, which will empower me then to love others. Here's the scripture, Ephesians chapter three, the apostle Paul is speaking to the church and he says, this is my prayer for you, that God out of his unlimited resources will empower you. Look at that, where? From God's resources, he'll empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Hey God, sometimes I don't have enough strength to love. Sometimes I don't have enough love. Sometimes I'm running out of strength. Sometimes I'm running out of fuel. Where do I get that when I don't have it? Right here. I've got to have this, this relationship with the Lord, draw close to him, and then he is unlimited. And he wants to fill me with his spirit, and he will resource me and empower me with inner strength through the spirit. You know what the end of that verse says? Is that when we allow God's strength and power to work within us, that God is able to do, man, this is for somebody today, God is able to do far above 
all that you can ask or think or imagine. I just feel like I'm supposed to tell somebody today that maybe you're in a dark place in your life. I, I'm supposed to tell somebody today, maybe there's more than one person here, that, you know what, if you'll allow God to become the source of your life and the source of your strength, that God has far above all you can ask, think, or imagine in mind for you, that he has a bigger vision and a bigger plan, amen, that he can do far above all you can ask or think. I think God has blessings in categories that you haven't even thought of yet. He has some blessings in some areas that you can't even imagine. Where does that come from? When I dive deep into the eternal flame of God's love, when I say, God, you've loved me and you're empowering me, now I'm gonna love others, it'll change the dynamic of your relationships. God's love will be there. So the greatest gift I can give my wife, the greatest gift I can give my kids, the greatest gift I can give you is to grow in my faith, is to grow in my relationship with the Lord. Hey, listen, we're all a little selfish, right? So when I grow in the Lord, I'm a little less selfish. When I grow in my relationship with God, I'm a little less irritable. When I grow in my relationship with God, I'm a little bit less of a mess and God empowers me and it affects every relationship in my life. So what are you gonna do? That means this, every day I'm gonna spend time with Jesus. Every day I'm gonna get into the word for a few minutes. Every day I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna let God fill me. At River, there's a lot of resources for you to draw close to the Lord. We have our new class called Fresh Start on Monday night. We have our First Step. Met several people today planning to go to First Step. There's all the small groups that are here. See, when you step into more of the family life here at River, this church will be more for you than just somewhere you go on the weekends to you know, experience worship and a word. When you join in with all the family life and the opportunities, this is gonna to start to feel more like a family for you, okay? But you've gotta take that step, and that's one of the ways you grow. Go back to guest services and look at all the opportunities we have back there for you, all right? Number two, fan the flame. Number three, stay positive under pressure. Stay positive under pressure. Songs chapter eight, verse number seven. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can rivers drown it. Water's right there, it represents trouble trouble that comes into our life, pressure that comes into our life. The Hebrew word is many waters cannot quench that love, it's a committed love. All the problems, all the stuff. In other words, in life, you're going to face difficulties. In life, the tides will rise. There'll be seasons where it's like, man, what's going on? It doesn't mean you're abandoned, it doesn't mean you're alone, it just means you're normal. Jesus said in the, in the world, you're gonna have trouble. And so here's what's really important that Jen and I have found is that it's important to stay positive under pressure. We started pastoring here after I'd been the youth pastor for a long time in 2002, started leading and the same, right in that season, Isaiah, our firstborn was born. And so we started pastoring and parenting at the same time. Right? I usually tell my friends I don't recommend that together, but you know what? It worked out great for us. But you know what? When we started pastoring, there was different kinds of battles. There was different kinds of pressures. When you start parenting, there's different types of pressures. Right? Come on. I mean, being married, there's pressure to be married. There's, there's pressure in single life. There's pressure in parenting life. Come on. Breathing is pressure. Come on, somebody. I mean, like, just being alive, there's going to be pressure. So what do we do? We have to understand how to stay positive. I'm going to give you two ways to do that before we close today. Number one, we can stay positive with our words. Positive with our words. Who knows what the most popular word in the English language is? It shocked me when I found out. It's not what you think. Most used word, most universal word, abracadabra. <laughs> How many are surprised by that? I was. Abracadabra, and do you know what it means? It's like the magician uses that when he goes, and abracadabra. Here's what it means. As I speak, I create. Like, oh wow, now we're talking. Because the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Can I tell you something that's true about you and your words? When you speak things, you create things. Your words set the atmosphere in your relationships. Your words set the atmosphere in your home. Your words 
can bring healing or they can bring hurt. Your words can build or they can destroy. Your words can unite, your words can divide. Your words can bring calm, they can bring anxiety, they can bring fear. There's an amazing power in your words. Someone said one time, sticks and stones will break my bones, words will never hurt me. And everybody that hears that's like, that's a lie, that's not true, right? Because we all understand words are powerful. There was a study done at the University of Chicago where they um, analyzed thousands of counseling sessions. And the goal was to find out what caused some people who went to counseling to come out of that and to be successful and others really didn't bear fruit from the counseling at all. And like different techniques and all that, guess what they found? The difference in the people who had success after counseling had nothing to do with the counseling technique. It had to do with the way the counselee spoke. It had to be with the words that they used, the language, how they talked about their life, how they talked about their self. One person said it like this, life is a grand scheme of Simon Says, and you're Simon. (laughs) In other words, whenever you talk, you're releasing something. Here's what the Bible says. In the book of James, James says that your words are like the rudder of a ship. James says, even though the ship is huge, you can change course with a very small rudder right at the base of it. And then he said these words, so also the tongue. It's small, but it's powerful. And so, wow, this is so amazing. I I believe this. Um, If you wanna change your life, change your words. When I say words, I'm talking about how you talk about yourself, how you talk about God, how you speak to others, the words you use in conflict, the words you use when things are going great, the words you use when things get hard, the words we use, they use when you're in a crisis, the power of your words. So the words you use in your relationship, let's talk about this. John Gottman, one of the famous marriage researchers, he took a full scientific approach to relationships. He had a place called the Love Lab at the Washington uh, University. And in the Love Lab, they had it set up like a living room or a kitchen. And what they would do is they would invite couples in and give them a couple topics. And they would put them in the room and then ask them just to talk about some things. And then they would watch from another room. And they would watch them for one hour. They would watch how they interact with each other. They'd watch the words that they say. And then, this is gonna sound crazy, they could predict after one hour with 94% accuracy how long they would be together. Is that crazy? What were they looking at? Words, interactions, the way they communicated. Here's a big scripture about it. I'm gonna give you some hope right here. Psalms chapter 19, verse 14. Psalms 19, this is such a powerful verse. I want us all to read this out loud because this can be a prayer. You ready? Let's do it. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Hey, if you don't pray anything else in the morning, this is a great prayer to pull out. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So he's saying, God, I want my words to please you. So here's a great litmus test. Would you use the words you use with your spouse if Jesus was standing there? Would you use the words you use with your kids if Jesus was standing there? Now, let me just say this and qualify this right now because it is a really hard word, right? Um, I do not hit this right all the time. Just gotta tell you, just because I'm preaching this doesn't mean I'm 100% on it, right? But how many know this is the goal right here? Lord, may the words of my mouth, come on, say it with me again. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I wanna give somebody a boom, a revelation that you might have never thought of. You ready? You don't have to say everything you think. It's true. You don't have to say everything. In fact, sometimes you think something, you gotta wait. Okay, I was gonna say this, but Holy Spirit, what do you want me to say, right? You don't have to say everything you think. Sometimes someone will say, well, that's, I'm just being real or I'm just being authentic. But sometimes that's a cloak for immaturity. You see, I don't have to say everything I think. I need the maturity enough 
to guard my tongue before I say something that I'd rather have back. I need the maturity enough to guard my thumbs before I text something that gets to somewhere before, right, I start to text. Before you send that email, before you send that text, right, before you respond to that, that post, we need to ask the Lord to guard our hearts, to guard our words. Here's the scripture, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 29, you ready? Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear him. This is right here um, in the book of Ephesians, a New Testament. Be careful about the language you use and be sensitive to what people need to hear, right? Be sensitive, what do they need in that moment? Because sometimes you gotta give people what they need, not what they deserve, and so you got to think about that. Now, this doesn't mean we don't have difficult conversations. This doesn't mean that, you know, someone said, well, how, you know, how do you confront people? Well, the Bible says you can speak the truth in love, right? And it's hard to do sometimes, but there's a way to do it. In other words, last week we talked about this. We have to learn how to complain without criticizing. Remember that? I'll give an example of it. Okay, let's say you, you need to complain about something in your relationship. And you say this. You say, you know what? When you said this, this is how it made me feel. That's a valid complaint, right? That's something we can, should be able to say in a relationship. Hey, when you said this, this is how it made me feel. What, what did I not do? I didn't attack the person, right? I didn't criticize them. I just said, when you said this, this is how it made me feel. What does it look like to criticize? Um, criticism is more like, hey, you know when you said that thing? I know you said it because you're evil like your mother and you're trying to get me back for what I did yesterday and you're guilty, you know? <laughs> how many see the difference? It's like I'm complaining, but now I'm criticizing, I'm attacking, all right? You all right out there? Okay, just breathe. It'll be okay, right? We'll get through it, okay? Watch your words. Speak words that build people up. If you think something nice, say it. Compliment. Sometimes you forget to compliment people after you've been with them a long time. Find something they did, compliment it. Man, they did a great job at that. You know, man, the project at work, whatever it was. Project at home, whatever it was. Hey, love the way you dealt with that thing. That was great. Find something, right? This week, everybody's been telling me, hey, man, love the new shoes, right? Okay, got, I get it. I don't buy shoes like once every five years, so it's a thing. I'm walking into a room right now. Um, I got, so now I'm just like, I walk somewhere and I was like, yeah, I know I got new shoes. Thank you, everybody, because it's a new thing for me, right? I don't buy them much. But so if it's shoes, if it's hair, if it's whatever it is, find something. In fact, turn to somebody right now on your own and just say, oh, I just think you're great today, all right? You're just, you're doing so good listening to this message. I can tell you're really into it. God's got great plans for your life. Your relationships are gonna be better. God's doing great things. Okay, now let me just kind of wrap it up with this then. The other way to stay positive is with our thoughts, with our thoughts. Let the words of my mouth and the what? The meditation of my heart. A lot of the times the reason we say negative things is because we're thinking them and eventually they come out of your mouth. If you're meditating on negative stuff all the time, if you're thinking about the negative stuff, it'll eventually come out. I'm gonna tell you a study right now, it's kind of shocking from the Gottman people. 69% of marital conflict is perpetual. <laughs> What's that mean, Pastor? It never gets solved. Welcome to River Church. We wanna make you feel better, okay? 69%, oh man, what's going on? It's gonna drive you crazy. Well, listen, Gary Smalley said this, in most marriages, there's 80% good and 20% that's not. He says, I'm not saying you don't try to work on that 20%, but here's the difference between a happy marriage and an unhappy marriage. It's what part you focus on. It's what you think about, right? If you're a Star Wars fan, it's what Qui-Gon said in Star Wars 1, right? Your focus determines your reality. It's where you put, where you land that deal, where, what you're gonna think. See, you can choose to focus on the negative if you want. So easy to do. It doesn't take faith to do that. It, it's, it's a lazy thing to do, really. It can come on you so strong, though, right? You can choose to focus on the negative. You can elevate the negative. You can amplify the negative. You can let the negative drive you crazy. You can let it eat away at you. Or... You can focus on the positive. You can focus on the strengths in that other person. You can focus on why you love them. You can focus on what you're grateful for. You can focus on the positives and you can begin to well up and it'll change your perspective. You can focus on the strengths of your spouse. Focus on the strengths of your kids. Focus on the strengths of your friends. It will change the trajectory of your relationships, I promise you. 
and how we tell our story. 95% of people that have a positive way to tell their relational history, 95% of them will be happy. Here's the big verse in the Bible. Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter four. Fix your thoughts. Why do we have to fix them? Because they kind of go wherever they want if I don't. Fix your thoughts on what is true and what is honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. And think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. We know that verse from what passage in the Bible, the passage about worry and anxiety, where he says, man, give your worry and anxiety over the Lord and then think on things that are good and pure and just. Juxtapose this scripture over your relationships. Juxtapose this over your spouse. Juxtapose this over your kids. Juxtapose this over people that God God has put in your life. And say, Lord, I'm gonna think about what is good. I'm gonna think about what is blessed. I'll, I'll give you a simple practice that I do almost every day. Start every day with gratitude. Get up in the morning when you get your coffee, whatever, and spend a few minutes with the Lord. And sometimes I just do mine. I'll just give you an example. I'll say, God, thank you today that there's breath in my lungs. Thank you that I got another shot at it today. Today's a new day. Mercies are new every morning. Thank you that I get a day to, to, to serve you. I'm going to try to do my best today to honor the Lord. Then I'll go through my relationships. Well, thank you for Jennifer. Thank you for the blessing she is in my life. Thank you. And I just start naming things about her. Thank you for my, I'll go through Isaiah, Destiny, Nicole, Riley. Thank God for my upbringing, my parents. I thank the Lord for people that spoke into my life. Start thinking about that more. I'm over 50 now. I like, Lord, thank you for the people that help develop me and pour into me and speak life into me. If you do that every day, it's called gratitude journaling, right? It's even more powerful. You write it down. If you do that every day, you'll find a shift that happens. It'll happen in your thoughts. It'll happen in your emotions. You're going to go into the day different when you go into the day with gratitude. The tides are going to rise in our life. Things will get crazy sometimes. There'll be pressure. Some friends of ours, Chris and Julie Jordan, um, told us a few weeks ago about the journey they went on when their youngest daughter was diagnosed with cancer at nine years old and kind of just a whole year of just treatments like Julie basically lived at the hospital for eight months. Chris lived at home, worked, taking care of the house, other school, other kids, all that. And they said, you know, they discovered in that time that a lot of the families that were going through trauma end up breaking apart because the pressure is so hard. They said, so we knew that we had to be super intentional. And Julie sent us a text. I mean, I could go for an hour on their story, but I mean, she talked about the community here at church and how you guys blessed them. Talked about the communication they needed to have in their house. Talked about the trust that she needed to have with the Lord, that he's, you know, we're putting everything in the Lord's hands. When Chris sent me a text and he said, you know, after eight months, it was like, okay, um, we're moving back in together and we had to get like counseling to help us to learn to be married again. What, what happened there? They were intentional, right? They were fanning the flame. And so I'm saying to you today that wherever you're at in your life, all right, if you're single, if you're, you're married, if you're single again, wherever you're at, in the relationships God puts in your life, but especially all of you that are married today, we have a choice. We can grow better we can grow stronger, right? But we need, to, we need to bring trustworthiness. We need to be intentional to fan that flame. And we need to learn how to be positive even when the pressures of life come. Part of that is the people around you. I mean, Julie sent us a text like, man, the community of people at River surrounded us. The people, the family. See, if you don't, if you don't have connection here yet, this is the moment when I'm saying, okay, you love these weekend services, the work people, you're going, man, man, I love the worship there, or, you know, whatever is happening here that you're coming, this is me, um, your pastor saying, man, make sure you get those relationships going, because if you go through stuff like that, you want people surrounding you that are like, we're praying for you, we're there, what do you need, what can we get for you, right? I can't do that for every single person in this church, but there's people here, and the connect leaders, and the small group leaders, and the friends and family leaders, that we all do that for one another. Would you pray with me today?